Islam literally should have a group of people that are practicing it, this ta'ifa. And the idea of it being a perfect religion comes right out of the Qur'an itself, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اليوم اتمت لكم دينكم Today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed for us our deen. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيْتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ I have perfected my blessing for you and, and, and I am content with Islam as your way of life. And deen is a very fascinating word when you look at it in the Arabic etymology of the word. It has to do with debt. Um, the, a dane is a debt. It also has to do with how you behave. Mandana uh, nafsuhu, the one who uh, conquers himself or overcomes himself. And deen also is a rain that returns again and again. Uh, the deen means an oft returning rain. And Islam is like that. It is literally a heavenly source of nourishment for the earth that returns again and again. And we are seeing once again the return of Islam and the fact that this uh, auditorium is filled with people in the United States of America is a sign of that nature, that Islam comes again and again. So Allah tells us this in the Qur'an. And that day was actually the day of Jumu'ah on the Hajjat al-Wada'a, which is the last Hajj of the Prophet wasallam, And it was done on uh, the Friday that this ayah was announced. Now, that was not the last verse in the Qur'an. Uh, there, there were some other verses revealed later, but those verses did not deal with ahkam. So literally the ahkam of Allah, or the rules by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded that people live their lives according to, which is the deen. كَيْفَ نَدِينُ bihi. You know, how we live according to this rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the sharia of Islam. So this is the deen is the Sharia of Islam, and Allah has perfected it. Now, in that perfection, the idea that literally Islam is complete and full, and that it is an inexhaustible source of guidance until the end of time. And what this means is, is that there are not people that can come at a later date and say that Islam needs to be revised. We need an updating. We need to uh, invigorate Islam with new ideas so that uh, it can really fulfill its function in the 20th century or the 21st century. We need a new uh, robotized or technological Islam or an Islam that is in harmony with the time or the age. And this unfortunately is an idea that's uh, been cropping up in the Muslim Ummah for some time. There are many Muslims that are actually talking about a complete revisal of, of literally rewriting the Islam. And there are many, you will see this particularly in some academic circles, the idea that Islam now is something that we have to look at it with a fresh perspective and recognize that we've had 1400 years of, for instance, from one perspective, which is the feminist, Fatima Mernisi type perspective, we've had 1400 years of male scholars that have been interpreting Islam and they need to be reinterpreted. This is a completely unacceptable uh, position in Islam because we believe that Islam is a protected deen and it was not simply protected in the time of the Prophet wasallam, but it has had an unbroken chain of protection throughout the centuries by the rightly guided scholars of this ummah among which were women the vast majority were certainly men but among which were women and they're mentioned in many books of the tabaqat and tadkarat al huffad and these type of things and certainly Aisha radiallahu has many fatwas and many hadiths uh, that uh, have come down from her, over 2,000 in fact. So looking at uh, these, there are 10 things that I'd like to look at that were pointed out by this great scholar, Sheikh Muhammad Amin, and the first one being Tawheed. The idea that Islam, the highest, and the really the, 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 the thing in which we are calling people to is Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we call them to Islam. And this is right out of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu when he sent his people to call people who used to say, call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if they answer you, then call them to five prayer. And this is called awliyyat. This is called taking prioritizing. You have to first call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you see a non-Muslim drinking, and you tell them that's haram for you to do that, uh, which from one uh, usuli position, it is, because there's a difference amongst the usuliyin. Our people, including the non-Muslims, uh, do they have taklif or responsibility of the uh, furu' 
or the particulars of Islam or are they only called to the usul or the principles of Islam? This is a difference of opinion that's valid. But nonetheless, you cannot call somebody to leaving wine if he doesn't understand that wine is prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, it does not make sense to him without a context. So the first thing that we call people to is tawheed. Now the completeness of the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that it is a, what is termed in uh, religious studies in the West a radical monotheism. In other words, that the, the, the monotheism of Islam, the absolute unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is uncompromisable, is unique amongst the world religions. Although we believe that Tawheed is the essence of every true revealed religion, they have been adulterated and altered and changed as time passed. So the, the Tawheed of Islam is literally the, the pure and final manifestation of the Tawheed of the Deen of Allah since Adam alayhi salam until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this Tawheed is based on a recognition of the absolute unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is one. And this uh, terminology, the idea of Allahu wahidun fi dhatihi wa sifatihi wa fi af'adihi, like the later theologians uh, used this type of terminology, which is actually not a terminology used by the early salaf, is nonetheless useful uh, in its articulation. But really, the pure tawheed of Allah, which is mentioned in the Quran, is summed up very clearly in Surah Al Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say that Allah, He is ahad. Allahu samad. Allah is completely independent of His creation. The definition of ilah in the Arabic language is al-mustaghni an al-kull wa al-kullun muftaqirun ilayhi. The one that is independent of all things and all things are dependent on that. And that is the meaning of samad. Lam yalid. Allah, nothing came out of Allah. Allah did not produce anything. Nothing was born out of Allah. Allah creates out of nothing. Ida khalaqa shay'an, He creates that thing out of nothing by irada by His absolute irada and His qudra. Nothing comes out of Allah. Creation is not something that came out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Nor did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come out of anything. Allah did not give birth, nor was Allah born. So this not only negates the idea of the Christian belief in the divinity of Christ, but it also negates the idea of the philosophical belief that somehow the, the universe is eternal that all of this has come out of the universe and there are people now that worship literally talk about the universe as if it was a god and really uh, like uh, Lewis uh, like the uh, the Christian um, the Christian writer C.S. Lewis said that uh, mother nature is the secularist word for God in other words if you look in books wherever they write mother nature all you have to do is put the word God there and it will make sense because Mother Nature makes absolutely no sense in terms of giving it some uh, reality that it that simply does not have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this Tawheed, the Tawheed of the, the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe out of nothing, what the Catholics called ex nihilo, is a uh, a concept which really the human aql does not have access to. It cannot comprehend the idea of something coming out of nothing. Because when we look at creation, we see that everything comes out of something. But what is termed as going back, if we continue to go back, there must have been some original point. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself in the Quran, Badi'u samawati wal ard, the originator of the heavens and the earth. And ibda' in the Arabic language means to create something ala ghayri mithal and musbaq, that has no previous, uh, it has no previous existence. So Allah is Badi'u samawati wal ard, literally. And the word in Arabic, khalaqa, to create. When we use it in terms of a human being, it means to lie. In other words, the human being is absolutely incapable of creating anything. We can make things. That is why we can be a sani. We can be a maker of things, but we cannot be khaliq. That is uniquely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute alone. So if you say ikhtalaqahu or khalaqahu in Arabic concerning a human being, it means to lie. Because human beings cannot create anything. They cannot even create a fly, like the Quran said. And all of these attempts to manipulate DNA and to uh, make life forms and things, this is all still 
based on materials that exist within nature. They are absolutely not creating anything out of nothing. They're simply taking different materials, DNA from this life form and splicing it onto another and creating a cat with leopard spots or something like this. This is, this is tabdil khalq Allah. It's changing the creation of Allah, but it certainly has nothing to do with creation. And it's something that in the Quran, Shaitan says that he will in fact uh, encourage the creation, the human beings to do that. So this idea of Tawheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتُهُمْ مَنْ خَرَقَهُمْ لَيَقُلُونَ Allah. If you ask them who created them, they will say Allah. So we agree at this point, the vast majority of creation will agree with us. If we ask them who created these things, they will say God in whatever language. Khoda, if they're in uh, Persia or India, they will say God if they're in German. They will say whatever they will say in whatever language, but they still have this idea of a creator with the exception of a small portion of human beings who are called uh, atheists, which is really a completely untenable situation. In fact, Fir'aun, who is... Uh, recorded in the Qur'an as disbelieving in Allah and saying Ana Rabbukum ala, that he himself was the Lord Most High in the Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًا that they disbelieved in the truth of Allah's signs although their own selves were certain of it so Fir'aun and his people knew the truth inside deep within themselves but they rejected it out of this arrogance, out of transgressing. And so even the atheist really is simply denying something that his own nafs is absolutely in certitude of, which is that he is a created thing and every created thing needs that which brought it into existence. And so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that in the Quran, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرَهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ That the vast majority of human societies do not believe in Allah except that they commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shirk has many variations. There are many types of shirk. But the, the dominant shirk of human societies is literally seeing that there is power intrinsic in something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given it. And this is something completely prohibited in Islam. We do not say that a medicine cures. We do not say medicine cures. What we say is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures through a means or a sabab. And this is tawheed. This is an essential understanding of tawheed. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures through medicine, but medicine in itself has no intrinsic power to cure. It's cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The other thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells those, uh, the, the human beings is that Tawheed itself is based on two aspects. The first is called Nifi and the second is called Ithbat. There is a negation and then there is an affirmation. And this is also articulated in the Quran in another way in which the, it is Kufr and Iman. The Kufr is in Taghut. That you have to make kufr of taghut, you have to be kafir of taghut, and you have to be mu'min of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is nafi with ithbat, and it is beautifully in the most uh, uh, simple language that even a child can say. Because the first uh, letter, that is the easiest letter for a child to actually say is the la, they're called the liquid letters. And this is the La letter. And if you look in the Arabic language, the La ilaha illallah is made up of these liquid letters, which are in Arabic are called the Tahruf al jawfiya which are the letters of the inner part of the mouth. And a child can say these letters. In fact, in uh, the English language, to low somebody, low somebody, is to put somebody at peace or at ease. And it comes from the idea of saying, La, 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 la. And this is where the lullaby comes from. And this is something that is universal, that w women all over the world use this uh, la, la to rock their children to sleep, quite literally. And so there is a significance in that a type of tuma'nina or tranquility comes to the heart simply through the physical expression of the lam, alif, lam articulation in the Arabic language and it is a fascinating point that the letters of la ilaha illallah are a repetition of this movement of the jawf letters. 
And so this, the idea of saying this, La ilaha illallah, is to negate which there's no shadda, there's no tashjee. La ilaha is easy to negate. Illallah. And now you have shaddatain. It's a heavy, it takes effort to confirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is easy to negate, it is difficult to affirm. And this is why criticism is uniquely uh, the, the capacity of every individual. Everybody can criticize, everybody can negate, but it takes effort to be constructive, to be an affirmer, to make affirmation. It's easy to find fault in the creation, to find fault in people, to find fault in our human condition. It's easy to do all these things, but it's difficult to be positive. It's difficult to be an affirmer. It's difficult to be someone who sees the good in things. But like one of them said, if you go on looking at creation for fault, you will go on until you find no end of fault. But if you go on looking for perfection, you will go on until you find no end of perfection. And these are the different ways. The kafir is an ingrate by nature. They look constantly and criticize. The mu'min by nature, uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, Safa al khayran tajidhu, that you should always be optimistic about situations and you will find things to be optimistic about. Ana inda wanni abdi bi. I am in the opinion of my slave. If you have a good opinion of Allah, creation will confirm that opinion for you. If you have a negative opinion of Allah, creation will confirm that opinion for you. The Muslims are people that have the best opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because their opinion of Allah is so great, Allah continually shows them and showers them with experiences in their lives to confirm that opinion which is a good opinion and the next thing says, وَأَنَا جَلِيسُ مَنْ ذَكَرَنِي Allah says that He is the companion of the one who remembers Him. And that is the quickest way to have a good opinion of Allah, is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the next thing of this, so the first thing is Tawheed, and this is really an inexhaustible subject. I mean, the Muslims spent centuries uh, just writing about Tawheed, and, it's, and it's, it's an inexhaustible subject, and really the theme of Qur'an is Tawheed. I mean, this is the dominant theme, although it's considered a third of the Qur'an, it is, is really uh, the, the, the continually uh, returning theme of the Qur'an is the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the next aspect, once we understand the Tawheed of Allah, that Allah is one and that He alone should be worshipped, the next important issue in terms of this perfect deen, in terms of the, the kamaliya of this deen is wa'al. And wa'al means admonition. It means to be in a state of awareness. Yata'al. Yata'al is to be in a state of awareness or admonition. And the greatest wa'al in the Qur'an above all of our other wa'al is the wa'al or the admonition of muraqaba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you wherever you are. Huwa ma'kum aina ma kuntum. He is with you wherever you are. Ma yalfidhu min qawlan illa ladayhi raqibun ateeb. No one will articulate a word except that there is two watchers over them, a watcher and a reproacher over them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, wa, wa, that he وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْيُسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We know what the soul is whispering in the internal uh, language of the heart. And we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is closer than the carotid artery itself. And the carotid artery is the source of our consciousness. If you cut off the carotid artery even for a few moments, physiologically, you will put a person into a state of unconsciousness. So Allah is closer to the human being than his own consciousness, than his own self-awareness. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this sense or understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence is what enables Tawheed to become a realized experience in the life of the individual Muslims and in the life of the community of Iman. So when the Muslim begins to take on this wow that is that literally you cannot find a page in the Qur'an that you will not find this wow from Allah, that He is with us, that He is present, that He is Alim, that He is Khabir, that He is Basir, that He is Samir. All of these, uh, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His knowledge is throughout the Qur'an. And if you read the Qur'an daily, you must gain a sense of the muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once this muraqaba is literally inter internalized, 
then disobedience to Allah becomes almost impossible. Disobedience to Allah becomes impossible. Why? Because you are in a state of presence before the king of the world, medical muluk. And in the same way that an individual who has any sense at all, unless he's majnoon, and the majnoon doesn't have any taklif, the madman has no responsibility. Unless he is a majnoon, if you are in the presence of the king, you will be in a state of waqar, in a dignified state, in a state of fearfulness, in a state of awareness. You will not breach the adab or the courtesies of the king's court. And you will know that if you, if you literally in any way uh, in Tihak al hurma which is defying the sanctities of the king, you will know that the, the sword's king is over the head. The sword's king is over the head. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى And to Allah is the highest analogy. So the human being, when he knows this, like the Prophet ﷺ, وَقَالَ مَنْ وَمَرْ إِحْسَانَ The إِحْسَانَ وَقَالَ مَنْ دَرَاهُ أَنْ تَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ That the one who knew, understood إِحْسَانَ is the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked by Jibreel السلام, what is Ihsan? The answer that every Muslim should literally become the, 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 the deepest understanding of Islam because Ihsan is the pinnacle of Islam. And the Ihsan is that you worship Allah as if you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you do not see Allah, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And so this sense of the presence of Allah is that which enables the Muslim to maintain the deen of Islam. This is what prevents the Muslim from entering into ma'asiyah. And this is really throughout the Qur'an. And I encourage all of you and myself to literally look through this, uh, the Qur'an from this aspect. Now another aspect of the idea of Ihsan is the whole idea of, of Hassan itself. الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا He is the one who created death and life to test you to see which of you were the أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The أَحْسَنُ here is from the same root word that Ihsan comes from. And it's a beautiful word because it literally on the one hand means beautiful itself. It means beautiful. Asma'Allah al-Husna are the beautiful names of Allah. And ethics is deeply related to the whole idea of aesthetics. In other words, wrong action is a discordant action. It is an action that does not harmonize with creation itself. And this is why any discordant action that does not harmonize creates dissonance. It creates something that breaks the harmony of the society itself. In the same way in, in music, when, when the notes are harmonized, Right? Then, then it's something that, that is flowing. If, if somebody who understands music, if a, uh, a note is introduced that is not in the structure of the music, somebody who understands music recognizes that harmony has been broken. In the same way, the one who is in obedience to Allah, when they are presented with disobedience to Allah, they recognize the, the dissonant nature of the action and enter into a state of disharmony. And this is why the Prophet said that the wrong action is that which creates this turbulence in the breast itself. So there's a disharmony that takes place inside the human soul if it is healthy. But if, in the same way that somebody uh, like these modern people that um, listen to uh, music that has no harmony whatsoever, uh, and I'm not don't want to go into a discourse about music or anything, but uh, aesthetics is an important aspect because birds are uh, part of the dhikr of the bird is uh, making uh, beautiful music. And the Quran is certainly recited with uh, cadences that are harmonizing by their nature and we're more attracted to a reciter that is reciting in a harmonious manner than one who is reciting in a disharmonious manner. But just like the ear, the heart, if it's out of sync, with the harmony of the ethics of the human being, it will not recognize the disharmony in the same way that the human ear, if it has no sense, what they call tone deaf in music, if it has no sense of harmony, then it doesn't, if it hears discordant sounds, it doesn't bother them. It has no uh, uh, effect on them whatsoever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has literally created this, this uh, deen in 
in order for us to harmonize with it. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى تكون هواه تبعني ما جئت به None of you truly believes until literally your passion or your desire harmonizes or is following what I have come with. So this really, the Muslim is the one, the Muhsin is the one who has literally harmonized with the deen of Islam. In other words, your own internal desires are in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires. And when something that is disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters into the picture, then the human being literally becomes in a troubled state or muttarib. And this is why Iman is based on sukun wa ittirab according to Muhasibi, that the nature of Iman is sukun, which is tranquility, and ittirab, which is a type of intranquility, and it is sukun to the obedience of Allah, or to the imtital of the awamr of Allah, to following the commands of Allah, and it is a kind of turbulence to disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the whole idea of wild, and it's really a topic that one could go uh, on and on about. But the... Uh, the next or the third aspect in which uh, the, the, the deen of Islam is perfect is in distinguishing between al-farq bayn al-amr al-salih wa ghayrihi the difference between a righteous action and a action that is not righteous. Now, if we look at two people, one of them, both of them doing wudu or the outward form of wudu. So the person takes, uh, washes the hands, takes water into the mouth, and you see him doing the wudu. By the consensus of the scholars, if they did not have the intention of doing wudu, that is not wudu. Although it has the form of wudu, it is not accepted as a purification for the prayer. It could be cooling himself off, cleaning his mouth and nose, whatever. But it is not wudu because the basis of wudu is in niyyah. This is an obligation of wudu. And like that, Righteous action, although two actions can look identical from the outward. If somebody gives sadaqah and another person gives what looks to be sadaqah, in terms of an outward judgment, they look the same, but they're different based on the intention. And so the whole idea of al-amal al-salih, which Allah has commanded us to do throughout the Qur'an, is that first it agrees with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down. This must be the basis of the Muslim's action that the actions al-a'mal tuwafiqu kitab allahi wa sunnata rasulihi that the actions must be in accordance with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the basis and this is many ayahs of the Qur'an وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ what Allah has given you, take it and what Allah, uh, what the messenger has given you, take it and what the messenger has prohibited for you then turn away from it قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ if say, if you truly love Allah, in other words, if you have tawheed, then you must follow the Messenger of Allah. وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنْ مَا تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَنْ تَضِلُّ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَبَدًا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَالسُنَّةِ I have left two things. As long as you hold to them, you will never go astray. The Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger. Kitab Allah fihi nabu ma qabrukum wa khabru ma ba'dukum. It goes on and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَمَنَ اتَّبَعَ الْهُدَى فِي غَيْرِهِ أَضَلَّهُ Allah. The one who seeks guidance in other than the book of Allah, Allah leads him astray by the sunnah of Allah in his creation. So we must have our actions in accordance with the book of Allah in the most basic poem that is memorized throughout North Africa. A, a, a poem that is used in, in teaching little children Islam. In the last section of it, uh, Ibn Ashar, rahimahullah, says, وَيُوقِفُ الْأُمُورَ حَتَّى يَعْلَمَا مَا اللَّهُ فِيهِنَّ بِهِ قَدْ حَكَمَا That the, the Muslim is someone who literally stops doing any action until he is certain what Allah and His Messenger have decreed in that action. And this is something that there's no excuse of ignorance. Ignorance is not an excuse because taklif by its very nature is to accept that we are in a state of responsibility. This is what taklif means. Allah kallafana, He has put us into a state of responsibility. Responsibility in, in both English and Arabic, mas'uliyah. Mas'ul is what's called ism maf'ul from sa'ala. In other words, He will be the one who is asked. In the same way, responsibility means the one who must respond. Their same meaning in both languages. Mas'uliyah means that you are the one who will be questioned. And Allah says in the Qur'an, 
and the greatest and most definitive statement about human uh, status in the Quran for all of those people who say, why should I do this or why or etc. etc. is that, uh, that Allah, لا يسألوا. Allah will not be asked. وهم يسألون. But they will be asked. Allah will not be asked. They will be asked. We will be asked. We cannot ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did you try me in this way? Why did you send this tribulation to us? Why did you put Husni Mubarak as the ruler of Egypt? It's not going to work. These are not acceptable complaints. You see, really. I mean, you can sit around and complain about creation all you want. But Allah will say in, and says in many ayahs in the Quran that uh, He has given us intellect. He has given us eyes and ears. He's given us an earth that's wide and vast. He's given us guidance and a deen. And he told us to follow the guidance and the deen. When we turn away from the guidance and the deen, that he puts us like Hassan al-Basri, one of them came to him and he said, Hayabina nakhrutu ala hajjaj. Let's go and, 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 and make a revolution against hajjaj. And he says, subhanallah, if you get rid of hajjaj, you're going to get uh, pigs and, and monkeys over you. In other words, the state that you're in, if you bump off the ruler, it's just like you bump off Sadat and you get Mubarak. You go, you go from a monkey to a pig, you know, literally. So it's, it's down the evolutionary scale. What's going to be next? A rat? You know, seriously. So, so change, historically change has never come from the top down. Even the Prophet ﷺ, who was given the ta'yid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was given the ta'yid of Allah. If you look, there was a ground swell that took place in that community that literally he transformed the oppressed people in that community and he made them people that could perceive the true state of affairs, that oppression is an illusion based on one's disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when one begins to turn to Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them tamkeen in the earth. And this is a promise in the Quran that Allah will give tamkeen. He will establish people in the earth. When they worship Him and they don't associate anything with Him, in other words, the pure tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will give tamkeen. But if you want tamkeen by some uh, uh, coup d'etat or something like that, well, like uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid said, I never saw a revolutionary build what he could tear down. You see, I never saw a revolutionary build what he could tear down. Because it's very easy to put a bullet through somebody's head. But that unfortunately doesn't end the argument. You see, the sirah or the conflict remains as long as the people are in the conditions that they were in that brought about that tyrant. That the tyrant goes when the conditions that brought about the tyrant go. But if the conditions remain, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what's in themselves. So the... No, I'm not even going to look at that because I'm just starting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm on number, I'm number three. I've got ten more to go. No, seven more. <laughs> the next, so since there, then there has to be, it has to be in agreement with the book and the sunnah. It has to be based on ikhlas. There has to be sincerity. They were only commanded to worship Allah with ikhlas. But ikhlas is based on tawheed. That is why the surah of tawheed is also called surah al-ikhlas. The surah of Tawheed is called the surah of Ikhlas. And Ikhlas only comes when the heart is free of Riya, of all of these things of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a process that must be worked on and strived on by the Muslims, especially those working in positions of leadership of the Muslims. If, if their hearts are filled with Riya and these type of things, then there's, we have no success. We have no success. If it's a popularity contest, if it's let's impress such and such or so and so, then this is really a destruction. If people say, it's like Imam Shafi'i, the most beautiful statement I have ever seen about somebody who had no nafs, who had no ego, is from Imam Shafi'i, who said, anhu, if I got into a debate with anyone about a mas'ala, about some uh, thing that involves the deen of Allah, I used to pray to Allah that Allah made the truth manifest on his tongue and not on my tongue, so that he could submit to it. So, I mean, this, these are men. That is a man. 
Not people that say, no, I'm right, brother. No, you're wrong. I'm right. And then it just go on from there until they start pulling out guns and things like that. Behaving like monkeys. Qarada wal khanazir. Wallahi, it's not, it's subhuman uh, behavior with this level of solving conflicts with violence. I mean, violence is like one of the Persians said about jihad, that we have to take up the sword sometimes to take swords out of madmen's hands. That that's jihad is we take up the sword to take swords out of mad people's hands. But violence is not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has decreed uh, b because we should be violent people. No, He's decreed it to prevent violence. And this is in the Qur'an, وَلَوْلَا دِفَعُ اللَّهِ نَاسْ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ Or دَفْعُ There's two riwayah. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَهُدِّمَتْ or hudimat, sawami'u wa bay'u wa sarawatu wa masajidu. I mean, this is the reason that Allah makes some people defend other people in order to preserve the worship of Allah. And not simply the worship in Islam, but the right for other traditions to worship Allah as they see fit. This is the glory of Islam. That we don't just defend the masjids, we defend the churches and the synagogues and the temples as well. Allahu Akbar. I mean, what other religion has that? The other religions say, let's tear down the temples. Let's tear down the masjids because they don't agree with us. The Muslims say, no, you have a right to worship Allah as you see fit. But we are the protectors. We are the qawwamun. We are the people that can establish justice. Not you, because historically you have never shown tolerance except to your own selves. Historically you have never shown uh, justice except to your own selves. It's like the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It's based on that everything, all the taxes go to Rome, and everybody's persecuted except the Roman citizen. And this is the Pax Americana, the American peace. The Americans can yitaqallabuna fil bilad. They can go wherever they want, but it's at the expense of the literally the destitution and the, uh, the slavery of the rest of the world's populations. Because all of their resources and all of their wealth goes like this centripetal force from the, uh, the, the, these countries into this source so they can all have their gratuitous consumption and Merry Christmas and everything else. <laughs> so, the, the next, uh, I'm going to have to go through these quick. Um, after sincerity, then it has to be based on Iman. In other words, that one's understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be correct. And, this, and I don't like uh, an emphasis on aqidah because uh, to me there's a big difference between aqidah and iman. Aqidah is something that is not complicated. It can be learned. Imam Tahawi's book is a very short book. You can learn that book in, in literally a month with a shaykh and that's it. Aqidah is over. Then you have to work on iman. In other words, not what you articulate on your tongue, but what you live in your heart. You see, and this whole emphasis on aqidah where it's like and Muhasibi says, Iyaka and Ta'budullah bil aqal, beware of worshipping Allah with your brain, with your intellect, where uh, tawheed becomes an articulation on the tongue, but nowhere is it experienced in the heart or in the actions. And certainly the the best behavior of somebody who has fear of Allah is that they're that they're ruhama bainahum, that they're merciful to the Muslims, but they're not uh, you know, the, the next is tahkim ghayri shar' al kareem that Allah demands that we literally have this tahkim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and this can't be uh, underemphasized. In other words, that the hukum is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hukum of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the hukum to shaitan, to tawaqeed, to hawa, the one who took his own hawa, رَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَتَّخَذَ إِلَهُ هَوَاهُ The one who took his own hawa, his own passion as his god, which is the god of the age. We're in the age of the, the idol of this age is the idol of hawa. You know, it's the I did it my way age. It's where everybody, if you look at all the advertising like Calvin Klein and all these people, it's all about no limits. Do it, just do it. Do it because it can be done. You know, there's no sense of hudud. You'll see some guy climbing up a mountain to the top of a mountain like a madman. That's something a madman would do for no reason. Just to climb up, literally put his own life in jeopardy. And people die, fall to their death. There was a woman in Pakistan who climbed K2, this English woman. Uh, she left two children in England, in Wales. And she climbed to this mountain to be the first woman ever to climb to the top of K2. And a big uh, snowball came and took her down the hill. And there's her two children that she orphaned. 
because, and everybody's weeping over this woman. They ought to be spitting on her grave. What, this, is a, the, uh, uh, this is child abuse. I mean, what are you doing climbing a mountain? Go home and take care of your children. Let the mountain take care of itself. And King 2, if you ever see a picture of that mountain, what that mountain is saying, what's called Lisan al Had, you know, in Arabic, the tongue of state, is saying, don't mess with me. <laughs> That's what the mountain is saying, don't mess with me. Really. And so this woman who wants to prove, well, that, you know, if a man got there, so can I. But why? If a man wants to go to hell, you want to go there too? If a man wants to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, well, if a man can do it, so can I. Let's jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, let's use our intellect here, you see. So this is, this is the type of, of what we're dealing with in this age of worshiping Hawa, of doing whatever I do. And, and America exalts in people that do these mad things, right? Really, they just uh, bungee jumping and things like that, you know. There are uh, more interesting ways to enjoy an afternoon than jumping off a bridge with a string, you see. And interesting enough, when, and, and some of the MDs in the room can confirm this, with the, one of the hospitals that I worked at in the, in the uh, uh, emergency room, a lot of the doctors on the weekends used to jump out of airplanes. Because they get into adrenaline rush, like when you have a you have a cardiac arrest and you have to split the chest and do cardiac massage. It's they like it. They start getting high. It's like a drug because adrenaline is one of the most powerful physiological drugs that we have. And so these people, when they after work's over, they go home and it's it's what's on television. It's not very exciting watching ER when you were just in ER. And so they decide to go out and jump out of airplanes to get that adrenaline rush. You see, and this is why. Many of them end up on drugs and things like that. And they just had an MD died of an overdose of fentanyl. They found her in the, in the room. Uh, she was in there and she had all these track marks all over. And drug abuse amongst MDs is very high in this country for a number of reasons, but that's certainly just one of them. So the idea of tahkim uh, with the ghayr shar And then uh, the Prophet ﷺ was told in the Quran about the Christians that sakhadu ahbarahum wa rahbanahum arbaba. What, that they took their uh, priests and their rabbis as arbab, lords, other than Allah. When, the, uh, when one of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, went to him, Adi ibn Hatim, who was a Christian before Islam, and he went and he asked him, he's the son of Hatim al Qa'i, the great generous Arab, and he asked him, we didn't take them as lords other than Allah. He said, did you make halal what they made halal? And did you make haram what they made haram? He said, yes. He said, then they're lords other than Allah. And so this idea of a hukum of other than Allah is a shirk in Islam. And this is one of the things that brings on the ghatab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمَ الْكَافِرُونَ And those who do not judge according to the decree of Allah, those are the kafirun. And that ayah should be very careful because a lot of people uh, take the ayah out of uh, context. Uh, Mujahid, who was the great student of Ibn Abbas, said this type of kufr does not, لا يخرج من الملة. It's not a kufr that takes somebody out of the ملة. In other words, the Jews do not rule by the rule of Allah, but we still call them Jews. And there are many Muslims that do not rule by the rule of Allah, but they still go under the hukum of Islam unless they openly deny. If they say, I don't believe in Islam, then they're kafir. But, uh, so that's, that's a, the next of tahkim ahwal al which is just the, look at the, the command of Allah to the rulers of the society where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاخْفَذْ جَنَاحَكَ لِمَنَ اتِّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Lower the wing of humbleness to those who follow you from the believers. This is to the best of creation, but it's to every person who has authority or has ruler over Muslims, that you should be humble. And this is how the ruler is commanded to be with those that he rules over. And then Allah says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ it's by the mercy of Allah that you were made soft. By the mercy of Allah that you were made soft. Had you been hard-hearted and, and, and brace and, and coarse, they would have dispersed from around you. Even when Musa is sent to Fir'aun and Harun, he, they're told to say, لهم, له say to him a gentle word. You see, so the, the ruler is supposed to be gentle and not be harsh. 
it does not mean that there aren't times for severeness. We, we know that Umar radiallahu anhu, he was harsh in the time when it needed shidda and soft when it needed lean. And the same with Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu, who was known for his softness, but when people refused to pay zakat, he said he would fight them, even though Umar said no. So this is all done with the hikmah, because the Prophet was sent, to teach them not just a book, but how to implement the book in their lives. Then Allah tells the people under, the rulers, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ati'u allaha wa ati'u rasul wa uli al-amri minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey His Messenger and those in authority over you. And in the beautiful uh, uh, subtleties of the Qur'an, Allah does not repeat for a third time, wa ati'u uli al-amri minkum. And obey those who are put in authority over you. It's by what's called aqf in there. Their ma'atuf and the ma'atuf alayhi is Allah and His Rasul. In other words, as long as the rulers are obeying Allah and His Messenger, then we obey Allah and His Messenger. When the rulers be disobey Allah and His Messenger, then لا طاعتي لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. There's no obedience for the created one, in disobedience to the Creator. And this is the wisdom of Islam. When Umar radiallahu said to his companions around him, what would you do if you see Umar in al-Khattab going astray, and the man pulled his sword and said, نُقَوِّمُكَ بِهَذَا We'll straighten you out with this, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he said, alhamdulillah, that there's still people that have some guts in this ummah. You know, and this is part of the tragedy of that people literally allow these tyrants to take over and not speaking out. وَأَعْظَمُ jihad, كَلِمَةَ الْحَقْ عِنْدَ سُلْطَانِ الْجَائِرِ The greatest jihad is not the jihad of the sword, of the physical sword, but the sword of the tongue. And in Arabic, the word kalima in Arabic comes from the same root to cut. It means to cut. And the word qalam, which is pen, also means to cut. And so the, the sword, the pen is is mightier than the sword because it is a type of sword. And it's the sword of the intellect which cuts through waham. It cuts through all of the illusion. إِذَا جَاءَ الْحَقْ زَهِقَ الْبَاطِنِ When truth comes, falsehood goes. And that truth is the truth of the sword of Islam, which is the victory of the deen of Allah. But it's also the sword of the arguments of Islam, the hujjah and the baraheen, the proofs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this ummah over all other ummahs. And so this is... Uh, and then in terms of just dealing with, so you go from the ruler to the ruled. You go from the ruler to the ruled and then you go even into the house. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu quwa anfusukum wa ahlikum nara wa quduhan nasu wal hijara. O you who believe, save your families and your, save yourselves and your families from a fire. And so Allah teaches us how to behave with the, our families. And tells us, إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًّا لَهُمْ عَدُوًّا لَكُمْ فَاحْضُرُوهُمْ In your, uh, in your wives, and not just wives, because that azwaj in the Qur'an applies to husbands as well. And even uh, Qadi Abu Bakr in his Ahkam al-Qur'an said that this can apply to a woman who has a tyrant. Just like Asiya had Fir'aun over her, there are women who have tyrants over them. And there are many good Muslim women who have bad Muslim husbands. So the ayah, although many of the translators are translated, surely in your wives and your children are enemies for you, that's not what it says. As wise applies to male and the female. And people should recognize that. So the, 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 there is a, Allah tells us that. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran that uh, we also khuz al afwa wa'mur bil urfa arad an al jahilin that you have to be forgiving. You have to be merciful. You have to turn away from ignorance. You have to do these type of things. So in these ahwal, these states, these Allah creates harmony. Allah tells us, "Insabilatihi ahsan." Turn, return wrong action in the best way. And certainly the tongue gets us into trouble more than anything else. Which is why every morning the tongue is literally all the limbs shake and say to the tongue, "Ittaqillah fina." In a'wajajta a'wajajna wa in tataqawwam na taqawwam. O tongue, be straight and don't be crooked because if you're crooked, we're crooked. And if you're straight, we're straight. So the tongue is very dangerous. And the tongue is literally that women have to have gentle tongues with their husbands and husbands have to have gentle tongues with their women. And if the women's tongues are harsh on you, then you should be like the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that was gentle with his women. There's a story of one Arabi man who was complaining about his wife 
and he went to uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was Amir al-Mu'mineen and he tarak al-bab, he knocked on the door and, and then he heard from inside his wife screaming at Umar and telling her, him what uh, Laos he was and he said, Astaghfirullah, this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, I don't have anything to complain about. He started leaving, Umar opened the door. And he said, what do you want? He said, well, la wallahi nothing, I don't want anything. He said, no, 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 tell me what you want. You came for something. He said, no, no, nothing. He said, unshiduka billah, you know, I'm asking you by Allah. He said, ya amir al-mu'mineen, kuntu ashtaki min, min zawjati. I was complaining about my wife, but when I saw what you're putting up with, I said, I don't have anything to complain about. And Omar radiallahu anhu, who everybody knows was harsh in a lot of ways. Omar said, he laughed and he said, ya akhi, he said, this is my wife who raises my children, who cooks my food, who cleans my house, who washes my clothes. Shouldn't I be patient if she gets angry occasionally? You see, this is so beautiful. And really, a lot of people don't understand in the Quran when Allah says, uh, that they have what is against them, that they have what's against them, and Allah says, and men have a daraja over women. Look what Ibn Abbas, who's Tarjuman al Quran, says about that daraja. He says it's the daraja of tanazul, which means that while he gives her all of her rights, he doesn't expect all of his rights from her. That's the daraja, that he forgives his wife for the shortcomings in his rights, although he gives her her complete rights, because he recognized this woman is in jihad. She's mujahida. She's doing tarbiyat al-awlad. The Prophet said whoever dies in childbirth dies a shaheed. That whoever raises a Muslim child in Islam has the ajr of a mujahid fi subirillah. This is jihad. And men, khidmatul rijal is jihad. Now we have to recognize the men, and I'm talking to the men here, our women are doing jihad, and we're not. So as far as I'm concerned, they have a maqam over us. Because those sitting around doing nothing aren't like those that ladini yudahiduna fi sabirillah. So we need to really get off uh, of our proverbial uh, you know, seats and get up and start doing jihad. And then we can start maybe complaining about uh, the women. <laughs> I know some of the men say, oh, there he goes again off about these women. <laughs> So, I mean, there's so many things, and he's uh, cut short my time. Uh, I wanted to go to iqtisad, to iqtisad, which is economics in Islam. And uh, subhanAllah, this deen has looked at everything. The, from economics, there are two things that the Islamic religion looks at. First of all, is what's called husna nadar fiqtisab al in other words, that where your source of income must be a good source of income. And that's the most important thing. What's called the halal, that you take your wealth from the halal. Because the, the, inna Allah tayyibun wa la yaqdaru illa tayyiba. Allah is pure and only accepts the pure. So if our wealth and our source of wealth is not pure, then Allah doesn't accept anything from it. And even our own food becomes haram. The cells that make up our bodies are made out of haram wealth. And, and this is why Masiya and all these things. And this is why food and guarding one's food used to be the major concern of the Sahaba. And this is mentioned in many books. This one. So Allah tells us about iktisab. When prayer is over, go out and seek the bounty of Allah. That Allah, this is not like Christianity that looks down on the world. No. The world is a place for us to earn our livelihoods. So there's nothing wrong. When in fact, wealth in Islam is not seen as bad as long as the haqq of Allah, the right of Allah in the wealth is uh, used properly. There's nothing wrong. We need wealthy people. We have too many fuqara. And we have too few aghniya. And I mean salihin. I mean Muslim ummah filled with aghniya that are just qarada wa khanazir, spending their life just in their shahawat and let that which is, these people are just, really, they have, like Sayyidina Ali, he said that man, he said, haramuhu adab wa halaluhu hisab. The haram of wealth is a punishment, and the halal of wealth is a reckoning. 
So really, people who aren't uh, thinking about wealth that Allah has given them to use to spread this deen, Khadija exhausted her wealth supporting the Prophet radiallahu anha wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Uthman ibn Affan, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who gave all his wealth, Uthman, uh, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari who brought dates to, for the ghazwa. Because he was so poor, but he gave, everybody gave what they had. And if this spirit of Islam returned to this, even just this auditorium, if people took on this, this really, this, it's amazing what can be done with that. So the iqtisad. And the second aspect of the iqtisad is that husn al fi sarfihi fi masarifihi. So you, guarding the way that you earn it and then watching the way that you spend it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَ إِلَىٰ عُنَقِكَ وَلَا تَبْصُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَصْطِ Don't make your hand too uh, stingy, nor make it too extravagant. It's a middle way with our wealth. Be, you know, اقتصاد in Arabic, like in, in English, economical means to be kind of, to not spend. But in, in English it actually means to be اقتصاد قصد is a middle way. So the iqtisad of Islam is following the middle way and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكُلُوا مِمَّا غَنِمْتُمْ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا Eat, devour what you have gained in a good way. And many ayahs, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا Those who when they spend, they're not extravagant, nor are they stingy, but between the two in a moderate way. And so this is the iqtisad of Islam. And then the next thing, which is the seventh one, is the politics of Islam. And the politics is based on two things, kharajiya wa dakhiliya, external politics, internal politics. The external politics that Islam teaches us in the Quran is, وَعِدُّ لَهُمْ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةً وَمِنْ رِبَاتَ الْخَيْرِ فُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَعَدُوَّكُمْ That we should prepare in power and strength of all forms in order to frighten our opponents. Now, irhab, which is taken on a very negative term in the modern uh, language. Islam actually believes in a true type of irhab, not in the blowing up buses irhab, but in the irhab that you scare people so much they don't want to fight you. You see, and this is really, we prefer a preventative method to war. And this is why Allah tells us, to prepare so that they don't want to fight you. And the Prophet said, نُصُرْتُ بِالرُّعْبِ I was given victory by fear that Allah struck in the hearts of those who opposed Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many ayahs of the Qur'an uh, about uh, guarding, being aware, خُذُوا حِذْرَكُمْ that watching and, and being aware of them and that you should know that these people want us to be heedless and to fall into heedlessness, which is what happened. So this is the siyasa al kharajiya which also is based on what's called ahkam al siyar which is the ahkam or the rules that relate to dealing international. We literally created international law. International law, even though the modern international law takes no look at the laws that Islam produced in international law, it's called ahkam al siyar but Islam really provided the world with its first sense of international law. And this is a historical fact. And our laws are based on justice, not based on injustice like these international laws, the League of Thieves and the uh, United Nations of uh, Exploitation and these things. Okay, just, I gotta get, I'm gonna get through. I have uh, two more things, two more. So let me just get to the 10. Because this is a whole, I want to get the whole 10 or else it's meaningless, you know. <laughs> like Deen al Kamil, Muhabra Kamila. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. People, do we have to go? I mean, what's the. No. No, no, no. Alright. Let me. I'm almost done here. <laughs> so, the, the Siyasa Dakhiriya is based on six things. Like Al Laqani says. وَحِفْظُ دِينٍ ثُمْ وَحِفْظُ دِينٍ ثُمْ نَفْسٍ مَا نَسَبْ وَمِثْرُهَا عَقْلٌ وَعَرْضٌ قَدْ وَجَبْ These are called the six kuliyat, some call them five, depending on the usuli, some put nasab and irb in the same category. But the six things that Islam came to preserve, this is the basis of the internal politics of the Muslims. The six, and if you want to talk about Islamic State, this is what the Islamic uh, governance is based on. It is based on preserving six things. And if you know them, and you should know them, 
The first is deen, that we preserve the deen of Islam. And Allah preserves that in several ways. Iqamat al-Salah is one way of preserving it. Also the fara'id al-Kitaya, that people have to learn the, the rules of Islam. And now, and, and I don't think this is an exaggerated state, Kitaya is ayn on people when they're not doing it. And there are not enough people learning the Islamic sciences. And it is an ayn on people to learn the Arabic language, to learn the rules of fiqh, one of the signs of end of time. You have lots of Quran reciters and nobody that understood it. And, and, and really, we have people that memorize from uh, Adif Lam Mim all the way to Nas, and you ask them the meaning of an ayah, and they don't know. And this is, uh, although alhamdulillah, they're preserving the Qur'an, the rules of the Qur'an have to be preserved. The Prophet said, يَأْتِيَ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانِ لَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا رَسْمُهُ There's coming a time on my ummah, on people, that nothing remained of the Qur'an except the, the, the letters. That's it. And he said, to his Sahaba رضي الله عنهم وصلى الله عليه وسلم أنتم في الزمان تحافظون حدود الله وتضيعون حروفه وسياتي على أمتي زمان يحافظون على حروفه ويضيعون حدوده You're in a time where you guard the hudud of Allah's deen the, the, the boundaries, the sharia and you're not, you, you know, you don't, not, not, because very few people memorize the whole Qur'an, but the actual letters are not known by many of you. But he said, there's coming a time on my ummah, many will know the letters, but they'll forget about the hudud. And so the, that's the deen, and then nafs. And the reason there's qatr, you kill somebody who kills to preserve nafs. And so the preservation of, of life itself is sacred in Islam. And, and then the preservation of... Uh, the uh, wealth, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded to cut the thief of the, uh, the, the one who steals, if they steal, why? To preserve the, uh, the, the wealth of Muslims. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved nasab, and this is why fornication is prohibited, prohibited in Islam, to preserve the nasab, the lineage of people. People have to know who they are, and where they came from, and who their fathers were. And this is all the preservation of the deen of Islam. And then the aqal, Allah has made khamar, the muskirat and the mufsidat. There's two types of things that influence the intellect. Muskirat are those things like wine, alcohol, spirits, those type of things. The mufsidat are drugs and those type of things like hashish, marijuana, opium, and now crack cocaine, and these type of things go under the category of mufsidat. And muskirat, they're all haram. All of them are haram. So nobody, some, I heard somebody say that marijuana was not khamar or something like that and, you know, I mean that's why they call them pothead, you know, because uh, they're just stupid. So there's no, uh, you know, preserving the intellect. And then the irr, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us to call one another names and things like that. So, because the irr of people, وَلَا تَنَابُزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ don't call one another names. Allah says, ba'da." Don't you backbite one another. Don't spy on one another. Guard the ird of people. So the ird is the good name of Muslim. And this is something people are so lax about in this age. Wallahi, people have no taqwa of Allah about the arad of people. And if you don't know something, if you hear things about people, to bayyanu. You have to find out whether it's true. Most things, my advice to you is just tell them, like one of the salaf, somebody came backbiting and he said, didn't shaitan find anybody else but you to bring me this stuff? You know, that's the way you should look at it. That people just, don't you have something more to ish wa'arak, you know, ish dakhlaq? Don't you have anything more to concern yourself with than the news of other people? Really? Like one man during the fitna, one of the sadiqeen was asked about Muawiyah because they want to find out whether you were with Ali or Muawiyah radiallahu anhum jami'an and he said shaghalatni uyubi an uyub ghayri I'm too preoccupied with my own wrong actions to be even thinking about what other people are doing wrong and this is the mawqif of the salaf like Sayyidina Ali one man asked Sayyidina Ali why is it all the tr trouble started when Uthman and you came into power when, when, when Abu Bakr and Omar were in power we didn't have fitna and Sayyidina Ali said because Omar and Abu Bakr had men like Uthman and me under him, and we have men like you under us. You see? So that's the whole problem, right there, in a nutshell. And then, so, uh, 
That's the siyasa. And then the, the next one is why the kuffar are over the Muslims. And the deen of Islam tells us, وَلَمَّا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ مِتْرَيْهَا قُلْتُمْ أَنَّا لَنَا هَذَا قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ And when you were afflicted with a tribulation that they were afflicted with, just like the kuffar used to be under us, and they see that as a musibah. Now we're under them. Well, Allah said, you ask, why did this happen? Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ It's from your own self. Every Jum'ah, the Imam for 1400 years has been saying, وَلَا تُصَلَّتْ عَلَيْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمُنَا وَلَا يَخَابُكَ فِينَا Don't put over us because of our own wrong actions those who have no mercy and do not fear you. And so the taslit of kuffar over us is by our own self. We can't, we have to stop blaming them. They're just like the dog over a dead body. You see, you can't blame them. Just like you can't blame uh, like people that uh, use uh, organ transplant and things like that. If, if, if the person wrote on the thing, you can use my liver or kidney, and then the person dies, they take the liver out. Don't blame them because you gave them permission. Through our wrong actions, we give them permission to come and take us over. And that's the truth. So we have to recognize that Sharia dealt with that as a problem in itself. And then the next is the Mushkira Ba'af al Muslimin and how to fight uh, the Muslims, how we fight them. And we know that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that the Ba'af is not based on weakness of uh, power, material weakness. That is not the Ba'af of the Muslim. The weakness of the Muslims is a weakness of Iman. And the reason for that is Allah وَلَقَدْ نَصَرْكُمْ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِ اللَّهِ Allah gave you victory in Badr and you were weak and obeyed in the earth. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. In the Quran it says that they say the munajikun say وَلَا تُنْفِقُوا عَلَى مَنْ عِنْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَنْفَضُّوا Don't spend on those who are with the Messenger of Allah until they disperse. Now this is what is called in modern times economic sanctions. That's exactly what it is. It's economic sanctions. And they put an economic sanction on the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. We know that for a fact. They did that. They completely tied him off. They would not allow people to sell to him anything or to his followers. They wanted to destroy them. But Iman is over that. Allah's power is over their power. These are tests from Allah for Rafa' al-Darajat and Takfir al That's all they are. And so Allah raises this Ummah up through these ibtila'at. That's how they're raised up. But we have to respond with the right response. Because the munafiqun are the ones that when things go bad, they turn away from Allah. The, the ones who ya'budun Allah ala harf, that they worship Allah just on the bare edge. When things are going good, they're with Allah. When they go bad, they turn on their back. No, we have to be with Allah when things are hard and when things are easy. Ajiban the amr al-mu'min, fa amru kulluhu khair. The, the Amr of the Mu'min is all good, his affair. If it's hard, he thanks Allah. If it's easy, he thanks Allah. And that's only for the Mu'min. And so that's the whole idea of the du'a uh, amongst the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَيْهِ خَزَائِنُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ they don't understand that Allah has in the, in, in the storehouses of the heavens and the earth. And if we truly believe that, then we know that power is with Allah. This is not a slogan. Hasha. The one who trusts in Allah, Allah is enough for him. That is not a slogan. But it has to be really believed and understood in order for it to be, effect, uh, to be effectual. Allah says, Allah is the wali, the protecting friend of those who believe. He takes them out of darkness into light. Iman is based that, وَأَنْتُمْ الْعَلَوْنَ لَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمْ الْعَلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't grieve, don't despair, and don't be weak if you are believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the condition. It's a jumla shartiyah. The condition is that you are the ones al-a'laun if you're in that conditional state of believing in Allah. And once the condition doesn't exist, then the, the, uh, what's it con contingent upon no longer exists either. And 
the last one is why sabab ikhtilaf al qulub why the hearts are uh, why they're in dispersion why our hearts are separate and this is a really important question and really the whole basis of quran can be reduced to two principles what's called dar al mafasid wa jalb al masalih putting off evil and bringing about benefit to human beings and this has to be the understanding of the muslims dar al mafasid which in usul is based on avoiding any harm to come to these six things that i mentioned before the deen the uh, the nafs the ma the nasab the 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 intellect the good name and these things so that's dar al mafasid and the jalb al masalih is doing good things and so allah has given us all of this guidance to bring the hearts together uh, in islam and if we follow that guidance that uh, allah will give us tawfiq unite the heart and the reason tahsibuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shatta you think that they're uh, d- uh, together but their hearts are dispersed allah said dhalika bi annahum qaumun la yaqilun because there are people that don't use their intellect and the reason that hearts become uh, different is because we're not using our intellect like the moroccan say ma kanch aql walu there's no they don't have any brains that this is why the muslims are separate because there's no brains because if we recognize that our benefit is in our unity we put aside our differences to harmonize in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish and i've said this uh, before and i'll just reiterate it again because reminding benefits the believers this is an age of defending the house not cleaning the house in other words we're being attacked from every side and we're all inside bickering about uh, you know who's going to wash the dishes and literally the house is being bombarded and we literally have to broaden our understanding a bit and recognize that our benefit is to work together and i read a book which is an interesting book done by a missionary in uh uh college a professor in missiology uh and he did a book called uh, the possibilities of dawa in america and it's a very interesting book and one of the things he said is that um that really the muslims will not have success in establishing the deen of islam and he gave several reasons among which were he stated the fact that their organizations rarely work together and in fact more occasionally work in antagonism to each other that they work against each other and they love that there is a man sponsored by the state department did a phd called uh, areas of potential uh, trouble between african american converts to islam and immigrant muslims they're already looking what are the potential areas that we can create fitna between african american muslims and immigrant muslims because they don't want us to unite they want farq tasu this is the great rule of colonialism and of every conqueror divide and conquer and so that's what allah tells us that we should unite the hearts that we should really make ta'lif al qulub to bind the hearts together la anfaqta ma fi al ardi jami'an ma allafta bayna qulubihim walakin allah allafa bayna qulubihim innahu azizun hakim ya ayyuhan nabi hasbuk allah wa man tabi'aka min al mu'minin o you who believe Allah is enough for you and Allah is enough for those who follow the messenger. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru wa jazaakum Allahu khairan wa salaamu alaykum. We have a few quick questions that we can answer really fast. Uh brother Hamza Yusuf, did you say that you are translating a dua and bayan? No. No. Aha, bismillah. Okay, another uh, the second question is some people say that those who emphasize loving the prophet are approaching shirk others respond by saying these people are heartless what is the middle way Well this is called the Pradi Diobandi conflict um and most people in here I think are of Arab background so they're probably not really aware of this uh, 
these two terms. But um, the middle way is what I would recommend for people is to read a book called The Shifa of Qad Iyad, Ta'arif Hukuk al Mustafa, which is a book written by one of our sound Sunni scholars, he was a and he wrote a book explaining who the Prophet is and what his rights are. And it's a book that was accepted by all of the Sunni scholars um, about the Prophet. And uh, people, uh, you know, what happens, I don't think so much shirk, but what happens is just bid'ah, which, uh, which is bad, but it's certainly not as bad as shirk. Um, I, I haven't met any Muslims yet who say that they worship the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I've never met that. Um, I, I hope I don't. Um, but I've met uh, some Muslims that, um, you know, uh, might do some things uh, that uh, would be considered bid'ah by the majority of Muslims. And so I think it's just a, a matter of understanding that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, the uh, what. Uh, uh, as Bosayri says in the Burda that بَشَى The extent of our knowledge about the Prophet ﷺ is that he's a human being. And he's the best of Allah's creation. You know, that's, that is the extent of knowledge. He is a human being. And he said, Don't go to extreme about, like the Christians went to an extreme about Jesus the Son of Mary, but I can fool you. Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. But say the, the slave of Allah and his messenger. Allah. I mean, it's very, I don't see it's really a problem. But love of the Prophet is something he said, Teach your uh, children uh, to love the messenger of Allah and to love the family of the messenger of Allah. You have to teach your children to love the messenger. And if really we don't celebrate uh, our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, children grow up not knowing uh, who the messenger is, you know? And I think it's important, you know, to remind the children. I mean, I started my boys like not even four, and I remind him all the time, you know, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, we learned this from our Prophet, and, you know, they have to have an understanding of who the messenger is. And one, a Mauritanian scholar that I knew, a man came to him and, and asked him, how can my love of the Prophet increase? And he said, read Sirah. He said, read the Sirah of the Prophet because you love who you know. If you, if you say, oh, I love the Prophet and you don't know anything about it, what kind of love is that based on? That's just a, a emotional, empty love. It has to be based on knowledge. Once you, I mean, for many people who don't cry when they read the Qur'an, the Sirah brings tears to their eyes because it's just the Prophet who this man was, Mustafa وسلم, the chosen one. Ya yuhal mudathir, qawm fa'anjir, ya yuhal muzammir. I mean this beloved uh, man that, who loved to go off into the mountain at Jabal Nur and just disappear from creation and Allah shook him out of that cave and said, go and guide this world. Don't you, the cave is not for you. That's the way of the Christian. Go out and be in the world. That's the way of Islam. Take light to those who are in darkness. And that's what he did. His nature was to be alone. He hardly spoke at all. But Allah made him speak. He made him do things against his, his natural inclination, which was to silence, which was to uzla, to uh, moving away. And he put him in the midst of the world. But one of the poets said that the caravan of civilization has been ambushed. And he said, and the Prophet ﷺ was sent to put it back on its right course and to stop these brigands. And this is what's happened. Wallahi, uh, the other day on the airplane, uh, this man actually using this computer, and he's playing a game on this computer. And I'm thinking, here's this grown man, he was a pilot. Um, flying with the uh, airline, but he was going, you know, just fine. But he's in his pilot suit. He was a man who probably had six years of college education with this machine that took an incredible amount of ingenuity and engineering to build. And there he's playing a stupid game with it. I mean, and this is the state of human beings, you know, wasting our time because this caravan of civilization has been ambushed. And so instead of these uh, instruments of, uh, of media and things being used to educate people, they're used to make them more stupid, to dumb them down. I mean, television is being used to make people stupid, to make them laugh at stupid, innate jokes, meaningless uh, sick comedy. I mean, if you can watch 
a sick comedy for five minutes, and I'm not talking a half hour, five minutes, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> uh, <it's a> <laughs>